Now let's spend a little time trying to understand the science behind fluorescence visualization of oral mucosa. How does it work? Before we go any further, let's first remind ourselves of some basic facts. The oral mucosa consists primarily of two layers, the epithelium and the stroma. The epithelium, referred to more completely as stratified squamous epithelium, consists of basal, intermediate, and superficial squamous cells. The stroma is separated from the epithelium by the basement membrane. The stroma consists primarily of connective tissue, mostly collagen. It also contains blood and lymph capillaries. Note that a surface layer of keratin of varying thickness can also be present, although it is not shown in this picture. Certain types of oral mucosa are naturally keratinized, while others can become keratinized as a result of chronic irritation or because of other disease processes. The mechanism of visual reflectance, or what happens when we see things under white light with our naked eye, is shown here. The type of reflection that mainly contri contributes to how we perceive an object is so-called diffuse reflectance. This is where photons of light actually enter an object, get scattered or bounced around inside, and then come back out to our eye again, that is, if they don't get absorbed first. White light is a mixture of all wavelengths of visible light, blue, green, yellow, and red. Short wavelength light, like blue light, is absorbed very strongly by mucosal tissue. Not many blue photons make it back outside the tissue, without getting absorbed first. Red light, on the other hand, is much less strongly absorbed by mucosal tissue. A lot of red photons manage to re-emerge from the tissue and make it back to our eye. This is why mucosal tissue seems to us to be predominantly red or pink in appearance. Notice that no new photons are generated in the tissue what comes back to our eye as a subset of what illuminated the tissue in the first place. Fluorescence visualization really is fundamentally different. When we illuminate the tissue with light of an appropriate wavelength, such as blue light, it enters the tissue just as it does for reflectance, but now it can get absorbed by special, naturally occurring molecules in the tissue called fluorophores. These fluorophores absorb the blue excitation light and then re-emit light at a longer wavelength, that is, green, yellow, or red, a fraction of a second later. Blue light excites fluorophores in both the epithelium and the stroma. The natural fluorescence from the tissue is relatively weak, much, much less bright than the blue reflected light. The Velscope handpiece allows us to see the natural fluorescence by blocking the much brighter blue light reflected back from the tissue. Also, proprietary filtering of the fluorescence light is performed to optimize the contrast between normal and abnormal tissue. Because the fluorophores in the epithelium and stroma fluoresce mainly in the green when illuminated with blue light, oral mucosa looks predominantly green in appearance when viewed through the Velscope handpiece. This picture shows the inside of the cheek. Incidentally, you can also see the teeth here teeth fluoresce more strongly than anything else in the oral cavity. There are five main fluorophores that are excited by blue light in oral mucosa. The first one we're going to talk about is flavin adenine dinucleotide, or FAD, and it's thought to be the major contributor to epithelial fluorescence under blue light excitation. It is a coenzyme involved in the Krebs cycle and is correlated with metabolic activity in cells. When a cell is actively metabolizing, there is a lower concentration of FAD. Therefore, dysplasia or cancer cells, which are generally more active than normal cells, exhibit less FAD fluorescence than normal. The major contributor to stromal fluorescence is collagen, and the collagen crosslinks that help maintain the structural integrity of the collagen matrix. Collagen crosslinks fluoresce strongly in the green when excited by blue light, as can be seen in this fluorescence microscope image of collagen. As dysplasia and cancer progress, 
the collagen matrix starts to break down to make way for the cancer to invade at the basement membrane. This breakdown is associated with decreased numbers of collagen crosslinks and therefore decreased stromal fluorescence. Keratin is a structural protein that fluoresces when excited by blue light. Certain areas of the oral cavity are naturally keratinized squamous epithelium, for example the attached gingiva and hard palate. Other oral tissues can become keratinized, or hyperkeratosis, and thus show increased fluorescence as a result of chronic irritation, or as part of the disease process, for example in leukoplakia. All other things being equal, this keratin layer, if thick enough, can show up quite brightly under velscope. Porphyrin is produced by bacteria and fluoresces quite strongly in the orange or red part of the spectrum when excited by blue light. The presence of bacteria is thus characterized by the presence of a remarkable orange-red color as can be seen in these images of some bacteria giving off an orange glow from a tonsillar crypt and also from some fissures on the dorsal surface of the tongue. Fibrin is a fibrous protein involved in the clotting of blood and can be seen in the oral cavity, for example, as part of an ulceration. Fibrin is a relatively strong fluorophore, as can be seen here. This picture isn't in the oral cavity, of course, but on the skin, and shows the fluorescent properties of the fibrin in a scab, which looked characteristically red in white light. It's important to remember that ulcerations in the oral cavity, which by their nature are symptomatic of some type of abnormality, will often look brighter rather than darker through the velscope. In these cases, it will therefore be quite important to view not just the ulcerated part of the lesion, but also the surrounding tissue, since the fibrin has the potential to mask an underlying loss of fluorescence. Both melanin and blood will increase light absorption in the tissue. Thus, their presence will cause a marked decrease in tissue fluorescence and result in a distinct darker area in the predominantly green oral mucosal tissue fluorescence. Particularly, blood strongly absorbs shorter wavelength light, such as blue and green. If you see inflamed tissue or vessel damage with free blood visible, you know for sure that this will appear dark through the velscope. This is a somewhat simplified graphic representation of the stages of dysplasia, which illustrates some of the main epithelial features of dysplastic progression into invasive cancer. Precancerous epithelial lesions typically start below the surface of the tissue at the basement membrane and grow until they occupy the entire epithelium. The various stages of dysplasia are called mild, moderate, and severe and are roughly correlated with the proportion of the epithelium taken up by the abnormal cells, as shown in the diagram. When the dysplasia takes up the entire epithelium, it is called carcinoma in situ. Once the basement membrane has been fully breached, the lesion is referred to as invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Note that in this picture, premalignant stromal changes, such as the breakdown of the collagen matrix, are not represented. Note also that the ideal time for discovery and intervention is in the pre-malignant stages, where the prognosis for the patient is just so much better. Here we see then, in summary, how dysplasia and oral cancer result in decreased fluorescence intensity. There are four processes at work. Number one, the increased metabolic activity of the dysplastic cells in the epithelium causes a decrease in FAD, resulting in decreased fluorescence. The breakdown of the collagen matrix, which occurs as a prelude to tumor invasion, results in decreased numbers of collagen crosslinks, and thus decreased fluorescence. Increased scattering in the epithelial layer due to morphologic changes that take place in the dysplastic cell nuclei. The effect will be to increase the backscattering of excitation light, which will decrease its intensity in the tissue and result in decreased fluorescence as seen by the naked eye. Increased blood supply needed to support the increased cellular activity of the dysplastic cells in the epithelium 
will result in additional microvascularization in the stroma and thus increase the absorption of light by blood. Also, as importantly, inflammation can be the natural response of the body to the growth of abnormal dysplastic cells in the epithelium, thus leading to increased blood flow to the affected area. Both of these effects will result in decreased fluorescence as seen by the naked eye. Well, we focused on the reasons why we expect to see a loss of fluorescence from dysplasia and cancer. However, it is important to understand that fluorescence pattern changes are associated with many different types of lesions. Moreover, this is a benefit rather than a limitation of fluorescence visualization. To be sure, neoplastic lesions are arguably the most serious and life-threatening in the spectrum of diseases that affect the oral cavity. However, the many other types of conditions are definitely worthy of the clinician's attention and can have a significant effect on the quality of life of the patient. Trauma, chemical irritation, side effects from medication, thermal damage, fungal, viral or bacterial infections, all of these will probably be more noticeable through the velscope, mostly because of the associated inflammatory response. Note that persistent inflammatory lesions in the oral cavity can be symptomatic of a systemic condition which, if left, left undiagnosed and untreated, can be life-threatening for the patient. Of course, in all these things, the gold standard diagnostic technique is histopathological examination of a surgical biopsy. A biopsy that yields a diagnosis of lichenoid mucositis, squamous papilloma, or mucous membrane pemphigoid, etc., should in no sense be thought of as false positives because they are not dysplasia or cancer. A definitive diagnosis helps lead to treatment decisions that can be very beneficial for the patient.